Welcome to another episode of Chax Chat. Join Chad Chilius and me, Dax Castro, where each week we wax poetic about document accessibility topics, tips, and the struggle of remediation and compliance. So sit back, grab your favorite mug of whatever, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Today's podcast is sponsored by Chax Training and Consulting. If you'd like your company announced during our podcast introduction, consider sponsoring our podcast transcript. My name is Chad Chilius. I'm an Adobe Certified Instructor, as well as Director of Training Solutions and Principal at Chax Training and Consulting. And my name is Dax Castro. I'm Director of Media Productions here at Chax Training and Consulting. And Chad and I are certified as Accessible Document Specialists by the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. And if you'd like your certification, head on over to accessibilityassociation.org slash certifications. They've got some great stuff over there, some good training material and uh, even some sample questions. So yeah, good resources over there. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, Chad, it's raining. <laughs> uh, I, I feel weird. I have the window <laughs> open and there, I feel this cool breeze coming through. It's no longer 110 plus weather. It is literally raining outside as we speak. Wow, that must be lovely. It is. It is. It's been uh, great the past two days. Uh, we did a little bit of yard work this weekend. Of course, there's always yard work to be done on the weekends. Um, and then right before the rain. So we got it all squared away. I'm excited. So That's great. I, I think I think fall is, uh, well, the, the, the official first day of fall is the 21st of September. Is that 20th? I, I'm not sure. In California, it is every year it works the same way. We get this giant heat wave. And then boom, it's done. And oh, fall man. just comes in like a lion. It is just wow. crazy. It's like one one day, it's like 112. The next day, it's like 86. And then it's like 76. <laughs> and then we're like, we're done with summer. We're all good. So yeah. it's so weird. Well, I, I'm always, I always hope that we have a nice long fall here in the Northeast because I know this Thursday, we're supposed to have a high of like 68. Oh, wow. Um, so the, it, I feel like fall is definitely knocking at the door and and uh, has arrived. But anyway, so what's going on? What's going on in the accessibility world? Well, interestingly enough, um, we have a class coming up on Microsoft Word coming up. It's actually in just about 10, well, about nine days from the time this podcast will be released. It's accessibility for Microsoft Word. And, and we talk about some of the basics and document structure and the proper use of styles, images, charts and graphs and dealing with that big mess inside uh, Word. We've got some really good um, uh, advice on how to kind of deal with Word art and formulas. And um, they call it smart art, which is, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not not a very good, accurate description, is it? No, no. And then uh, accessible tables, kind of what it means to be an accessible table in Word, because a lot of people think, right, in a, in a table inside Word, you're like, oh, I'm just going to give them the native Word document, and it's just going to be more accessible because it's a live document. Not not so true, right? We're going to talk about would- that in today's podcast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you would think, right? You you would think that that would make sense, but um, in, in many ways, you know, a PDF can be way more accessible than than the Word document itself. So, well, and I think people don't understand that. They feel like, yeah. oh, well, the source document's more accessible. You're like, great. Try to get to the alt text when you're you when you're just using your keyboard only uh, on an on an image to figure out what that is versus having it automatically announced by the PDF, right? Right, right, right. Um, and then we're going to talk about the um, choice of color and using color, good color contrast. Uh, and then in the class, we talk about the Microsoft Word accessibility checker, when to use it, how to run it, what it looks like, what are some of the things it misses, right? And then we're, yep. in our class, there are three different handouts, right? Well, actually, there's four different handouts. If you consider, we have 10 tips for writing accessibly, tips for writing effective alt text, and then there's a, a, a Microsoft Word accessibility checklist, which is a really good resource. And then uh, a document on running the accessibility checker, which is uh, 
conveniently enough, what we're going to talk about today. So today's yeah. podcast is a, about running Microsoft's Checker and and some of the merits of why you should do it and and what it looks for and some of the things it doesn't check out and and uh, you know how you should kind of go about that. So um, yeah, that's guys. Stay tuned here. We are we have got lots of good information for you in this podcast. Yeah. So I mean, you know. Um... You know, the word accessibility checker, I think in a lot of ways is similar to the Acrobat accessibility checker, right? You know, it's like, um, it, it's not a comprehensive tool, right? You know, so it's, it's not a tool that you can, uh, you know, put, put all your eggs in, in one basket and say, oh, it passes the word checker, you know, I must be good. Right. You know, well, I think it's 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 interesting that they use the term accessibility checker because you assume that once it's done checking, if it found anything and you fixed it, that it is, in fact, now accessible. I yeah. think they need to, like, change the name to make it a little bit more um, more accurate, because really the, the accessibility checker is more like your level one checker. Like, right? did I ha get all the low hanging fruit? Right. Right. And, and again, like we've talked about this with the Acrobat checker before too. It's like, you know, you, you, you don't use it as like a comprehensive tool, but it is super helpful. And, and, you know, this applies to the word checker as well. It is super helpful to find, as you had said before, the low hanging fruit. It's right. like, you know, Oh, did I remember to add alt text to all of my images? Did I, you know, um, you know, did, did I avoid merged cells in a table? Right. Right. At, at least if, if the focus is making the word document accessible. So, um, well, so you yeah, bring up a I good mean, point there though, Chad, uh, about the table. Right. And so I think this is one of the, it's really a truth and a myth all in the same breath. Right. Because tables can have merged cells inside word. If your final document is a PDF. But right. where the where the whole no merge cells comes into play is that if I'm using NVDA or JAWS inside a, a Word doc, there is no underlying code that I can manipulate or or qualify to allow a table with merge cells to be read correctly. It won't right. read stacked merge cells. Usually it's those first two rows and you've got, you know, row one has got some merge cells in it. Maybe there's some subcategories in row two and they're both marked as header, which is fine in a PDF. But when you get into the Word doc, the Word doc can't properly parse that table correctly. So you don't get all of that voice data, which is why people say no merge cells inside a Word doc, right? Well, and, and I think the other part of where that misconception comes from is that the, the word checker itself, right? Like when your table does have a merge cell, the word checkers solution to the problem is don't merge cells. Right. Right. Like that's literally the solution. You know, it says, Oh, you have merged cells. Don't do that. And, and I can't tell you how many times, like we've been teaching classes on PDF accessibility and, and people are like, oh yeah, I know that you can't merge cells in a table. Right. And you have to kind of like back up the truck a little bit and be like, well, that's not exactly true. I, I get where you got that from, but for, for the PDF format, it, it has more capabilities. Well, I, I feel like it's like going to the doctor and you say, doctor, my, uh, my elbow hurts when I do this. And he says, don't, don't do that. Don't do right? that. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay, but Hey, can we fix the problem? I kind of feel yes. like Acrobat is that let's fix the problem, right? Let's, yeah. let's make it work the right way. And I think that it, I think that the shyness of it all, like why do people shy away from it? It's just lack of knowledge. It's just lack of understanding. We have a class called um, uh, uh, Advanced Table Remediation and we have a Tables Basics class. We have two different classes on these. Um, we don't have them on the calendar yet, but boy, if your team is looking for uh, looking for that class, let us know. We'd be happy to put it together for you. But um, that actually brings me to a good point, Chad. I want to let people know that if you go to our website right now, accessibilityunravel.com, and you look at upcoming online training, it's a new menu item. It actually shows you our training calendar, 
all the way through the end of October. And you can actually subscribe to the calendar. You can actually, if you have a Google calendar, iCalendar, Office 365, or even if you have some other calendar, you can export the ICS file. But either way, you can literally add our calendar items our items to your calendar um, so you you don't miss out. But we've got for October, um, well, for September on the 29th, we have accessibility for Microsoft Word. Then October, it's forms, testing with NVDA, and designing with accessibility in mind. And we just finished designing with accessibility in mind a couple of weeks ago and got some really great feedback from everybody about yeah. that class. So yeah, we really did. I mean, I think there's a lot of good information um, to just kind of to, to give people some guidance, right? You know, it's yeah. like, what, what are the things that I need to do and and be aware of, um, you know, whether you whether you're using InDesign or Word or PowerPoint, you know, or a Illustrator lot of or Photoshop, right? Sure. I mean, sure. It, it's not just about those desktop publishing, because I know if I'm doing something, if I'm creating a document inside Photoshop, which... I have to sigh. I have to get it out of the way. Shouldn't be creating documents inside Photoshop, but I get that some people do, right? Color contrast is still an important thing. And how do you deal with a document that's completely made in Photoshop? Were you considering alt text and how much text do you put in and what do you do on the back end? All, all stuff that we reveal in that class. So I'm excited. And your forms class that's coming up on October 6th, the last class we had, we had 14 people, 15 yeah. people in that class. It was great. It was a, a very full class. And guys, we don't pack these classes full. We don't want 30 no. people in the class. We want to give you guys some individual attention so everybody gets those questions answered so you feel like you're getting something out of it. So we limit our class size to around 15 people um, at max. Well, and we want everybody to feel comfortable asking questions, right? You know, when you're in a class of like 30 people, you're like, oh, I don't want to ask that question. But in a smaller class, you know, and it's kind of cool to see um, people kind of develop a friendship you know, within yep. the class, you know, where they, they kind of, you, you know, um, feed off of each other a little bit and, and get to know each other. And, and so then people feel more comfortable asking questions. And I always say, if you have the question, I could guarantee you somebody else has a question too. Absolutely. Right. You know, you're not Absolutely. the only one to, to have that question. So something I didn't know, but I feel like I should have known is that there's two different ways to get to the accessibility checker. Now, the first one is the one we always, you know, we always think of, which is when you have a Word doc open, you go to the review tab and then your bar changes and you go to check accessibility and run the checker. But I did not know that there is under the file and info tab. There is protect document, inspect document, version history, and manage document. Under the inspect document, where it says check for issues, if you hit that button, one of the three options there is to check accessibility. I didn't know that. You know, that's interesting, Dax, because that is the way that I've always gotten to the Acrobat or the uh, word checker. That's Are you the way serious? That I've, yeah, I always... I, I never really remembered which tab it was under, but I always oh. knew it was under info. And so that's how I would, I would access it. So that, that's really funny that, you know, you, you always took one approach and I took a different approach, you know? Well, I think Chad, it's what makes us great. I think it's what makes our team, our team work so well. You and I is that we're always coming at things kind of from different angles, right? Sure. I'm always tomato and you're always tomato and you know it's it just makes for a really great soup so yeah i i totally agree i mean i i think that's one of the things that helps us to work well together is that we don't both think the same way yeah i mean we we both have the similar objectives but we have different thought processes right yes and i and agree it makes it makes it really cool i you know and there's sometimes where i think about stuff solutions to problems i'm like what would Chad do here? How would he take? <laughs> Seriously, I do. I do that sometimes. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. So so um, so running the checker, we can get to it from two different spots. Um, but what are some of the things that it's checking for, right? Mm. And in fact, Word uh, Microsoft has a page that allow that lists all of the different things that. Um, 
that it's checking for. In fact, chat, um, in the handout we give out for the word class, uh, running the accessibility checker, uh, there's a link to it, um, to the Microsoft page. Uh, and, and guys, if you're interested in this handout, let us know um, and uh, sign up for the class. We'd love to see you in there. Uh, but some of the, the, it really divides the checker rules into four different categories, right, Chad? Um, Microsoft kind of breaks the possible categories um, in the accessibility checker into four separate categories. Uh, there's one category for error, and that's basically content that makes the document difficult or impossible to read. There is warning, and that's content that in most cases makes the document difficult to understand for people with disabilities. There is a tip category, which is content that could be presented in a different way to improve the user experience. And then the last way is intelligent services. And that is which I hope you is... never use. <laughs> I will say, Chad, I hope you never use this feature content that is that is automatically made accessible by the AI. What it, and... most of the time, what that is, is suggested alt text. Right. Yep. Do yep. not let word try to write your alt text for you. We've talked about that previously on the podcast. And, you know, the, the irony of that whole feature is the fact that in the alt text, it literally says uh, alt text generated. Yeah, with high confidence. That, that's what it is. And you're like, why would you include that in the alt text? You know what I mean? Well, I was thinking about that, Chad. And I guess it, I think the reasoning behind it is if it's automated, I might want to know yeah. that it's automated, right? But I that's guess true. to me, my thought is, look, if you're in our space, if you're in the accessibility space, you better be writing some alt text. If you're if you're relying on automatic alt text, shame on you. Shame sure. on you. Right? Oh, absolutely. Um, and because we know it's not going to be good. <laughs> image of sunglasses is never the description for a bar chart. I don't know how many times I get. I mean, every time I test it, it says image of a sign. Yeah, that, that, that's that's what it that's what it's able to, you know, to to determine. So, well, well, some of the most common uh, checker errors that you're going to get. Right. Um, and again, this is on our handout. Come to the class and we're going to talk about all of these and we're going to run through these in a couple of different scenarios for each one. But the first one is almost always missing alt text. Right. And that's pretty self-explanatory. You can right click on an image and then add the alt text and, and or mark it as decorative if the item is is in fact decorative. Right. The next one is image, image or object not in line. Now, this is one where it depends on what version of, of Word you're using, because some of the older versions, 2016 and prior, um, Word does a really bad job of understanding where to put things that are text wrapped, things that are floating text boxes into your layout in the read order. But the new Office 365 does a really decent job of, of trying to infer where that item goes, even when you apply word wrap. So most of the time when I see image or object not in line, I ignore that error. The only caveat to that is, is if your agency says you must have a passing compliance report from Word as your first step, um, then of course you might have to go back and and. Honestly, Chad, this is the one that I think trips up so many people because they don't understand how to use section break or how to use uh, columns. And so when they have these images and they want them in a very specific spot on the page, what's their knee jerk reaction? They create a table. Well, you, you know, the, the interesting thing, and, and you're right, Dax, I mean, the, the newer versions of Word does a better job because, you know, basically what happens is like when you... Uh, insert a, a picture, it actually gets the, the anchor is wherever your cursor was when you inserted that picture, right? Like that's right. where the anchor falls. And then, and then if you adjust the layout with text wrap, if desired, you can move that picture wherever you want, right? But fundamentally it's wherever that anchor was. So, so you're absolutely right. I mean, in that, in that case, Word has really improved that quite a bit because in the older versions, the, that connection it was, was not, not very clear. Yeah, it, it was. Well, a lot of times it would, they would just dump it into the end of the document, 
If you had a floating That's text true. box, it would just end up at the end, right? Yep. But but you yep. and I both know when people have problems positioning items, what's their go-to methodology? What do they do? They put it in a table. Yes, they put it in a table. And guys, yeah. the, you know, you've heard us talk about Access Word several times. Access Word has a feature where you can click on that table and just say layout table. And then yep. here's the read order, the direction. I want you to read this layout table because someone decided to use it to kind of position things on the page. But if you don't have Access Word or Common Look has Common Look Office, but that's a different process, um, then you're really kind of stuck in with having all this content in a table that you might have to then um, pull out. So the next item under most common checker errors, which is number three, is merged or split cells in a table, right? And right. we talked about this mm -hmm. a little bit earlier, but um, you know, the, the minute in Word that you merge a table cell, um, you're going to get um, a, a message. So, so you'll have a category called merged or split cells in a table, and it's going to kind of, be, you'll be able to highlight that table cell. And it, it essentially says, you know, why should you fix it? And it basically says tables should have simple structure so that they can be easily navigated and understood by users of AT. Now you've heard Dax and I say this a million times, right? I mean, your, your, your best approach with tables I don't, I don't really care what your destination format is. Ideally, the simpler, the better, right? I mean, the, the, the simpler mm -hmm. you can keep them, the, 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 the easier things are going to be. Um, and, and in the word accessibility checker, it says steps to fix. Um, it, it basically just tells you to test and simplify the table structure. I think they've right. updated this DAX because they used to say, don't merge the cells, right? You know, that right. used to be the solution to the problem. Um, now I think they've, they've almost gotten a little more vague, um, maybe because of what you just said, right? You know, that there are, there are times you could get away with it. And what right. they're saying is what we always say, test it, test it and see how it, how it reads and, and, and then make a decision based on that information. Well, you know, it's interesting though, because I find, and you and I both find this, is that often if you're getting a checker error for your table complexity, you need to look at the table and say, ask yourself the question, is this really the most simple way I can present this data? And it's not just from a, uh, an accessibility standpoint, but just an overall yeah. readability standpoint. I find so many people try to mash so much into a table and you're like, look, this, I mean, this should be two tables or three tables or, you know, whatever. Um, somebody the other day in the message board says, I've got three, what should be three separate tables. But then at the bottom, the last row is a total of these three separate tables. How do I keep the tables separate and then have this total row that kind of uh, totals all three of the tables. And I thought, you know, that's an interesting question because I do see that, you know, from time to time in our documents and someone else chimed in, which makes my heart sing because it means people are learning in our group, but somebody yep. else chimed in and said, I would just take that last total row out and put it in a paragraph tag and have it be a summary statement for the table. And I thought, what a great solution, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that is a great, uh, a great idea because, you know, when you, when you keep it in the table, you've got to follow that table structure, but right. you know, when you break it apart, you, you're actually, arguably you're making it easier to, to, you know, to navigate. So that, that is, that's a great, that was a great suggestion. We don't often experience footer rows in our tables. People just don't use True. them, but this is a case where there is in fact a footer row, but it's not a footer row of the table it's in. It's a footer row of all three tables on the page. So the, the best practice there of converting it to a paragraph, to a summary statement, I think was a, a great, a great um, item. Um, yeah. You know, we talked about uh, checking the read order, which are, is our next common uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. Word accessibility checker error. Um, and really it's when you're using 
text wrap or when you've inserted a floating text box into your document. And we kind of talked about that a bit before where it used to be Word would throw that stuff at the very end of your document. Um, but now it's done a much better job. So how do you check the read order in your document? This is the thing I find most interesting, Chad, because it tells you check your read order. Well, if you're in Word and you're designing the document, you're not using AT, you're not using assistive technology. Most people would look at that and go, yep, looks right on the page. Right. Well, and th the thing about Word is that Word by nature has a very natural top to bottom flow. Right. Right. You know, like, uh, you know, when you, when you compare it to a program like Adobe InDesign, InDesign lets you put anything anywhere that you want on the page. Yep. Word does not like word makes you work for it. If, yeah. For lack of a better term, you know, like word wants your content to start at the top of the page and naturally flow to the bottom. So if you, uh, what am I trying to say? If you go with the flow and you leverage that top to bottom flow, your read order is just going to be correct. Right. It's one of the nicest things about Word is that you don't have to really think about word flow most of the time. Um, no. It's really just kind of there for you. And, yeah. uh, you know, but but going back to the, the, the question, how do you check that read order? Really, yeah. the answer is there's a couple of different ways. But one of the ways is inside Word, you actually have um, the ability to read aloud. So inside Word, if you go over on the review tab and you go to read aloud, you can hear the, the text to speech processor that's in the document. And, and is that the best way, Dax, to, to check your reading order? Well, I think for a lot of people who have IT that kind of get in the way of being a, an IT department who kind of says, nope, you can't have NVDA or JAWS. You can't, um, you know, we're not going to install third party software. It's really kind of your only way to kind of check that read order. Um, and, and you'll find that most people who have a cognitive disability might probably be using the read aloud feature inside Word. Uh, they could be using other third party tools too, but I think it's your first, your first step is, okay, how does this sound? It's not like Acrobat's read aloud, which really doesn't read the same read order. There's only one read order in the document. There's no tags tree inside a live Word doc. And so I would start with read aloud inside the live Word doc. And then if I don't hear what I think I should be hearing, then I might move to, to NVDA or JAWS and see if I get a different result. But but really, that's how you could test your read order um, and just let it read the document naturally and see, did it skip that item? Did it move to the paragraph the same way I expect it to? Um, that kind of thing. Did it read my sidebar the way I, in the order in which I intended it? So yeah, I think it's a inside a live Word doc, it is kind of the first first step. And that's kind of what I was saying, like in Word, if you want to create a sidebar, you really have to work for it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, like Word doesn't have like a button that says insert sidebar and and let you populate that that little sidebar with information. I mean, you you, you really have to be a pretty astute Word user to add a component like that to a Word document. Right. Well, I think you, you know, dragging a floating text box inside your Word doc, again, used to be catastrophic. It would dump it yeah. in at the end. Your read order would never be correct. But now, you know, adding a floating text box for a sidebar for a right column isn't, you know, isn't going to necessarily break your document. So I think um, overall it can be pretty easy, but I think you still need to judge the impact it has on your document and where that where that paragraph is going to be read um, in the context of your entire source. So, so the, the next one uh, under most common checker errors is number five, which is hard to read text contrast. Now, you know, we, we've talked about this Dax numerous times. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to read text contrast is the warning you get. So when you're in word, if you use light green or light gray for a font in, in your headings, it's going to tell you, you have text that doesn't meet minimum color contrast. Oh, and so, so that's a, that's a really great feature. But the, the, the thing that, that you and I always stress is 
this should be something that you do at the very beginning of the process. Right. Because it really is a bit of a pain to have to deal with 75% through your project, right? right. You know, you, you, you've added all your content, you've already colorized everything. Um, now, again, if you've leveraged styles in word, which you should, right. Right. Making those color changes is a lot easier. Because sure. you can just go into the style definition and say, oh, I used this light green heading. That's no good. Let's make it something w with more significant contrast. Right. Well, and, and what I think, though, is the, the, the biggest roadblock here is that everyone who's been reviewing and approving that document thus far has seen it with the light green yeah. heading. And so you get far more pushback, even though it doesn't make a dang bit of difference, whether it's light green or dark green, but because people have been seeing it for so long a certain way, everybody, does, no one likes change. Everybody, most people yeah. are resistant to change. And even though it's inconsequential, you almost always get pushback when you have to change uh, three quarters of the way through a project. So what you just said makes me think of two key things. Right. That I think that I think everybody needs to keep in mind. You're 100 percent correct. Like when when people have reviewed the document and they've seen it several times, they, they kind of fall in love with what's in front of them. Yep. And if you go back and say, hey, that that light green heading, we're now going to change out to purple. They're going to like they're going to revolt. They, they, they're not going to want, you know, to your point, they, they don't like change and they're going to revolt and they're going to just like, no, I like, I like the way it was. Right. But I think the other key thing to remember is that accessibility involves many people. Yep. And it's why you and I are always advocates of get your team on board, right? Yeah. This is not just your responsibility as the the document creator or the designer this is this is a responsibility of everybody who's involved in the process and so the more everybody knows the more likely that as this document passes across a number of sets of eyes somebody's going to say hey does that meet color contrast that that seems a little bit light to me you know, right. And just ask the question earlier on instead of, you know, as we're saying that, like when you're three quarters of the way through the process. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and the last one here, Chad, is no header row. And this is the one that's the easiest to fix. If you go into, if you were to take that, that same table, right click and go to table properties in the row tab, you can go down to repeat as header row at the top of each page, right? Now, whether your table breaks two pages or not, it doesn't matter. You're actually designating the however many rows you have selected as the actual header row. So that could be one or two. But so, so if you've got one row, you've got an easy checkbox. If you've got more than one row, you need to go into those table properties and actually select that item right? And make sure. The other thing you want to do is uncheck the allow rows to break across pages, right? Because inside Word, if you export this document out to PDF and you have broken rows across pages, it's going to convert them into two separate rows rather than keeping them as one actual row when it comes to generating that PDF. And so then, you know, the, the, the final step, right? I mean, yeah, again, the, we've been focusing on the word checker um, and, and presumably your, your objective has been to make the word document itself accessible. Right. But, you know, if your objective is to make a PDF uh, from this word document, I mean, there, there are a couple of ways to do so, but I, I would say like the, the, the primary method is using what we refer to as the PDF maker and the PDF maker is installed when you install Adobe Acrobat on your machine. So, right. so when you install Adobe Acrobat, it's going to add what's called the PDF maker to Word, PowerPoint, and it also adds it to Outlook. Now, uh -huh. now again, making PDF from Outlook is not where we want to go here, but, but anyway, the, the, the PDF maker uh, basically just gives you an engine for making an accessible PDF file, and you'll find it in the Acrobat tab 
in the ribbon in Microsoft Word. Right. So, so the key option that you want to enable in, in the PDF Maker dialog box is the checkbox that says, enable accessibility and reflow with tagged Adobe PDF. Yes. Right. So that's <laughs> fundamentally, that's going to add tags to your document. That, that one's critical. And the one thing about the PDF Maker, and Dax and I, you've talked about this. When you look in those settings, you're going to see a checkbox that says, enable advanced tagging. And, and, and that alludes to the fact that somehow it's going to make things better, <laughs> but it, it doesn't. I mean, Dax, what have you seen? I, I've just seen it overcomplicate the tagging structure. Absolutely. And usually this is 2016 and prior for the Microsoft Word where you see that enable advanced tagging. And I think there was a little window of time in Word where they thought, oh, we'll make this more accessible and someone <laughs> didn't understand what they were doing. And yeah, don't ever check that <laughs> box. It never works great. Yeah. It always breaks everything. Most people are like, I've done everything. My document's just not coming out right. And I'm like, okay, let's look at your settings. And so they show me and I see that advanced settings. I'm like, yeah, no, don't do it. <laughs> Turn don't. it off. It's a, it's a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Anyway, awesome. Cool. Well, guys, I hope you guys got a lot of great stuff out of this. This is just a preview of the stuff that we're going to be covering in our accessibility for Microsoft Word training that is coming up next week, right? So if you are interested in learning more about that training, go ahead and go over to accessibilityunraveled.com. It's on our homepage to scroll down a bit or go to online uh, upcoming training. And uh, you will see that that session is September 29th from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. 11 a.m. Wow, 11 p.m. would be a very long class, Chad. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. a lot of accessibility. I'm in I'm in bed by then. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> you're in bed by nine. What are you talking about? Um, I know, I know. But um, so 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So translate that into whatever time zone you're in. The classes are $2.99. It's literally 100 bucks an hour to get some of the best accessibility training from arguably some of the most knowledgeable people, Chad and I, if I might say so myself, um, when it comes to access getting accessible content either in Word or out of Word. So, um, and you're going to get some great handouts. So uh, head on over. And if you use the promo code earlyb 22 um, you can save 75 bucks. So it brings your course down to like 224. I don't know, that's a weird number. Uh, it's either, I thought about making it 225, but then it's like, well, save $74 seems so weird. <laughs> anyway, yeah. get some money off your course, get your company to pay for it. Or if you're a, a freelancer, this can really help you elevate what you can charge for a document. When you have certification or trainings um, that help you do your job faster, better, stronger, um, you should be charging more. So, so take that into consideration. All right, guys. Well, listen, once again, we want to thank Chax Training and Consulting for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. And just remember, if you're looking for in-person or online training or struggling to establish an accessibility program within your organization, head over to AccessibilityUnraveled.com to learn more. My name is Chad Chilius. And my name is Dax Castro, where each week we unravel accessibility for you. Thanks, guys.